So some of you know that I have a musical background, but you might not know the nerdy extent of that musical background. You know, there's kids who are in band, and band is awesome, highly recommend it, really, really awesome. But then there are kids who are in band who play the bassoon. <laughs> and I was the kid in band who played the bassoon. So if you're not familiar with a bassoon, uh, think of Hall of the Mountain King or uh, Mickey Mouse in Fantasia. Uh, the, uh, that's the bassoon. They call it the belching bedpost. <laughs> yes, I played the bassoon. But I'll tell you this, I don't play the bassoon anymore. I don't play the bassoon anymore. There's a number of reasons why I don't play the bassoon anymore, and I'll get to those in just a second. So the reason I bring this up is yesterday was instrument choosing day for Heidi. So Heidi's in fifth grade. She's going into sixth grade, and she wants to do band next year in middle school. And so we got together uh, at the high school, and the band director was there with all the kids from the band, and they have all the instruments, and you can go try a trumpet. You can go hit a snare drum for a couple minutes. You can go, you know, give a try to all of these musical instruments. And, you know, the, the line for some of those instruments is not very long. And not a lot of people want to play the bassoon. You know, and when I say I played the bassoon, like I, like I really played the bassoon to where the, the paper, the Oregonian, which is the largest uh, newspaper in Portland, Oregon, the Oregonian did a piece on me before our state championship run my senior year, which, by the way, was our third state championship in a row. <laughs> So like I said, when I say that I played the bassoon, like I really played the bassoon, but I don't play the bassoon anymore. And at the end of this lesson, I'm going to give you some of the reasons why I don't play the bassoon anymore and why there's a spiritual lesson to be learned in all of this. Because I promise, I promise, this isn't just a major nerd flex. I actually have a point that I'm going to get to at the end. You know, playing the bassoon, just like anything else, is not like riding a bike, except for riding a bike, I guess. You know, we use that phrase, it's not like riding a bike. If you don't ride a bike for a while, actually riding a bike can be kind of hard too. But our faith, if you don't practice your faith, if you kind of put your faith on the side, if you put your faith in a case and then tuck it into a closet and ignore it for a couple of decades, it's not like you can just pick your faith back up and go, well, yeah, I used to be on fire for God. I used to know a lot about the Bible. I used to be really involved in church. I used to be very active in my faith. I used to do a lot of personal evangelism. And then I got distracted for a few years. I, I got busy with work and family. I pursued that career. I had all those hobbies. I got worried about the election and politics. And all this stuff got in the way. Well, you know, isn't your faith just sort of like riding a bike and you just pick it up whenever you want it's just like like you never even left it I don't think so if you set your Christianity off to the side and you ignore it and you just leave it unattended it's not like it's just there fresh and ready to go whenever you want actually it becomes ineffective and brittle and superficial being converted to Christ is about much more than just having forgiveness of sins, which of course is an important component to being a Christian, but really conversion to Christ is about transformation on a most fundamental level. It's lifestyle change, it's habits altered, it's thinking adjusted, it's new goals being set for yourself. In short, I need to ask myself when I wear the name of Christ and claim to be a Christian, have I truly been converted to Christ? But how did I get to this point? Maybe I find myself as a Christian with a hard heart. Or maybe I feel really effective, ineffective right now in my faith. Or maybe I just feel like I'm going through the motions. Maybe, maybe you feel that way too. How did I lose my fire? How did I, go from, how did I go from being excited about Christianity and, and the things of God's kingdom to it just being on the back burner and just neglected and ignored? 
Well, have your Bibles open to Mark chapter 4, and I want to notice here in Mark chapter 4 a passage that we're all very familiar with. We've read it a hundred times or a thousand times or however long you've been alive, you've probably read this a number of times. In Mark chapter 4, it says, beginning in verse 9, Jesus was saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, as soon as he was alone, his followers, along with the twelve, began asking him about his parables. And he was saying to them, to you it has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, they get everything in parables, in order that while seeing they may see and not perceive, while hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they return and be forgiven. Do you understand this parable, Jesus said in verse 13? Well, how will you understand all the parables? And he talks about the parable of the sower and the seed, and he explains what these all mean. And you're familiar with that parable. You know what it is, that the sower comes along with the seed, and he throws it onto different kinds of soil. And depending on the receptivity of the soil, the word either grows or it doesn't grow. Or maybe it grows for a little while and it gets stifled out. Or it grows for a little while and it dies off because it has no firm root in itself. And Jesus explains this by saying, the sower sows the word in verse 14. And these are the one who are beside the road where the word is sown. When they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. In a similar way, these are the ones on whom seed was sown on the rocky places who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. But they have no firm root in themselves, but it's only temporary. Then when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. Others are the ones on whom seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word, the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. And that's really where we focus today is the becoming unfruitful. How do you get to that point of becoming unfruitful where your faith has been put into a case and tucked away in the closet or you sold your faith to a pawn shop because you needed a little extra money and now when it's time to actually use that faith, what could sure use that faith in your life in a time of desperation? It's not there anymore. It just doesn't work. In this parable of the sower, we find that you either don't seize the faith that is offered to you, you fail to grow it properly and have a good, uh, good underpinning, or you neglect it. And that's where a lot of us find ourselves in our faith. He goes on a couple of verses later to talk about unfruitfulness. Notice verses 24 and 25. Take care what you listen to. By your standard of measure, it shall be measured to you, and more shall be given you besides. For whoever has, to him shall more be given. Whoever does not have, even what he has, shall be taken away from him. I'll admit, I've always found that passage to be a little bit perplexing. That if you have, you'll be given more. If you don't have, even what you don't have is taken away from you. Like, I've always just thought, like, well, what exactly does Jesus mean by that? Well, I think what Jesus means is that if you are an unfruitful person, if you have, if you have put your faith on the back burner, you've just assumed you can just come back to it later, you may find that when you're unfruitful in life, spiritually, that faith won't be there for you anymore. Let me give you an analogy. Let's say you've got a, a pot of boiling water, okay? And you're, you're going to use it, right? You're getting dinner ready. You're, you're trying to get something ready to go. And you say, well, I don't need the boiling water yet. So you move that boiling water to the back burner. You turn the back burner on. Now, I understand that, uh, I understand that in 15 minutes, is that boiling water still going to be there, kind of chugging away? How about in an hour? In an hour, is that boiling water still going to be there, boiling away? But let's just say you leave a pot of boiling water boiling overnight, and then a day later, and two days later, and a week later, eventually, and I didn't do any kind of math on this, so, you know, I struggled. I might have done well in band, but I wasn't great in chemistry class. But at some point, if you leave a pot of water boiling long enough, what's going to happen to the water in that pot? It's just going to boil away and there'll be nothing there. Our faith is the same way. 
When you just leave your faith on the back burner, you just kind of neglect it and ignore it because you got family things and soccer tournaments and you got your career that you're pursuing. And I'll get back to my faith when I'm done with school, but school's really weighing heavy on my right now and I got a lot going on. And if you just kind of put your faith away and put it on the back burner, eventually what happens to the water in that pot? It just boils away and there's nothing there anymore. And I think that's what Jesus means by that statement. That even the one who does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. When you neglect your faith, eventually, at some point, the faith just evaporates altogether. Or, like in the parable of the talents, the master comes along and sees that one talent buried in the ground and says, you worthless servant. I told you to go do something with that talent. What did you do with it instead? You buried it in the ground and you did nothing with it. And what did, in that parable, what did the master do with the talent that had been buried in the ground? He took it away and gave it to someone else. People who lack commitment will not be put to work because they can't be trusted, either by the people around them or by God. And I think Proverbs chapter 25, verse 19 points that out. Your Christianity can't just be put away for a while, like a hobby that you dabble in, at least without consequences. Let me give you some signs to watch out for, some things that you might look for in your life that are indicators that maybe you've put your faith on the back burner. Some stuff to watch out for. Number one, maybe you're having a hard time remembering some of the big picture stuff at our church. Like what we're studying in class. Like you just, you just never remember what it is that we're studying in class. You never like queued up. You never really are prepared for class. How about what our goals are as a church? How about what our theme is for the year? How about what any of our deacons do? Or who your group leader is because it's the second Sunday of the month so you got your group meeting this morning. Like if you just, and, and I'm not saying this to make fun or to poke at anybody, but just... If you just find yourself going like, well, I just don't feel like plugged in. Like, I just don't really know what's going on at East Shelby. Like, I just never really know who to go to or who to talk to or what's going on. Like, maybe that's not a sign that it hasn't been communicated to you. Maybe that's a sign that you just haven't been listening to the communication, that you're kind of unplugged from what's happening in our congregation. How about you're rarely asked to help in any way? Because just people just know you're just not a reliable person. You can't be trusted to help with this or substitute teach or, or you know, rise up and do something on a Sunday morning when we need someone to fill in. Like Nobody asked you to do anything because the last time you got asked to do something, you shirked a responsibility. You weren't there. You have a growing sense of just feeling out of place. You just have a growing sense of, like, I just don't really belong. Or maybe the worst one of all, you're approached by a fellow church member and you ask, so where are you visiting from today? These are all signs that maybe, just maybe, you've put your faith on the back burner for far too long and you are disconnected and you are unplugged and you're in danger of becoming unfruitful. Jesus uses a phrase back in Mark chapter 4, dull of hearing. They've become dull of hearing. And Jesus frequently encountered those who had become dull of hearing. And the problem, of course, was not their ears. When Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear, he doesn't literally mean if you don't have ears, you're excused from hearing. The problem is not the ears themselves. The problem was always the hard hearts. And that's why he quotes from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And that's not the only place, by the way, that that passage is quoted in the New Testament. And if the issue is our hearts, then it's because we make ourselves unable to hear, even to listen to the truth. It is our hardness, our stubbornness, our distraction, our worldliness that does that. So I'll end with this. Why I can't play the bassoon anymore? Why, can't, why couldn't I just pick up a bassoon tomorrow? And I saw that, that high schooler playing the bassoon there, and, you know, lonely, no one's waiting in line to try out the bassoon. Poor kid. 
Why couldn't I play the bassoon anymore? Because I, I couldn't. I'm just telling you right now, if you handed me a bassoon, it's been too long. It, it's been 20 years, whatever. Well, here are some reasons. Lack of dexterity. I mean, I just don't know if my hands can do that anymore because I haven't practiced it. I haven't tried it. I am not you know, familiar, it's not right in the front of my brain. Now, I'll admit that maybe I've learned some other skills in the last 20 years uh, that have sort of replaced bassoonery in my brain, and that's fine. But lack of dexterity, how, lack of resources, a lack of opportunity, you know, both of those things come about because uh, when I was in college, I was a music major my first year and thought I would go down a musical path and just, you know, just got kind of burnt out on it. And so I always knew preaching was my backup option. Nobody laughed at that. They're like, we can tell. You know, you just, you just don't need it anymore. I'm not going to play it anymore. You sell it. And if you don't have a bassoon to practice, do you have the dexterity or the ability to practice and, and be good at something? If you don't even have a bassoon to practice, of course not. And so you sell off those resources. Lack of commitment. Well, of course there's a lack of commitment. If I wanted to play the bassoon, I'd go play the bassoon. And again, lack of practice. But I think really what it boils down to, pertinent to this lesson, is like Jesus points out, it just kind of comes down to let him who has an ear to hear, hear. It's just a lack of desire. I don't play the bassoon because I don't want to play the bassoon. And because I don't want to play the bassoon, I don't go buy a bassoon. And because I didn't buy a bassoon, I can't practice a bassoon. And because I can't practice a bassoon, I don't have the dexterity or the ability. Now let's reverse engineer that back to our faith because that's actually the point of the lesson. Why don't you want to be more committed to things of the kingdom? Why don't you want to be more passionate, more committed to things about knowing and studying the Bible, applying it? Why aren't you more excited about evangelism and reaching out to your friends, your families, your neighbors with the saving message of the gospel? Why is it that you keep people at church at arm's length? You don't want to let them into your life, your vulnerability, your failures, your flaws, even your sins that are unresolved and unrepented. Why? Well, just like with a bassoon. Because you don't want to. You don't op take opportunity. You don't find the resources. You don't invest. You don't commit. You don't practice. You don't have the ability. It's got to start with the heart, my friends. It has to start with the heart. Now, that's easier said than done. I get that. And in a 15-minute lesson where I've just tried to stuff the parable of the sower and bassoonery into 15 minutes, that's really difficult to do. At the very least, all I want to do in this lesson, I just wanted to pique your interest in this. I wanted to, to grab your attention. And hopefully, if you find yourself feeling this way, maybe in this camp, in this boat, you feel like I'm just disconnected, I'm unpracticed, I'm just, I've lost what I used to have. Talk to any one of us. Talk to me. Talk to someone that you're comfortable with. Engage with other Christians. Reach out to us. Maybe find someone who you see is on fire for the Lord, who does have really, really extensive Bible knowledge, and that Bible knowledge is being put into practice in their life. And ask them, what is it that you're doing that's helping you to stay strong in the Lord? And when you engage with other people, just like when you engage with other people with a passion, with a hobby, or an interest that you share, you come together, and I think that that excitement and that zeal is infectious, impacts everybody around you. So I'm going to offer a prayer at this time, and I certainly hope that if anything in this lesson has touched you in your life, this prayer is in particular for you. So let's lift, our, let's lift our hearts up to God and pray at this time, and after which we'll be dismissed to our group meetings. Let's pray. Our holy and heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful day. We thank you for all of our blessings. We thank you so much for the church. We thank you so much for all of our brothers and sisters. We pray that you will light the fire in our soul. We pray that you will help us to be motivated and driven Christians. Help us to know your word, to be diligent, to preserve unity in the bond of peace. Help us to view each other the way that we ought to, not as just...
people who share a building, but people who share a kingdom with each other, fellow citizens of heaven. God, if there's anybody in our congregation, and I'm sure that there is, who's feeling disconnected, please, God, help us to connect with them. Help them to find the will and the motivation to reach out, to open up, to be vulnerable in the things that they're struggling with. God, we pray that we would be a more loving congregation. Help us to excel still more in the love of the brethren. God, help us to use the seed that is given to us, the word, and to, to spread that, to sow that seed to other people and to do so in genuineness and zeal. Help our behavior to be excellent among those who are lost so that perhaps by our behavior, we may show what is different about us from the lost world. God, we thank you so much, especially for grace that is found in Jesus Christ alone, your Son and our Savior. We pray that we would continue to be strong in grace and grow in grace. We pray that we will preach that grace to others and show that grace truly does make a difference. God, we pray all of this in your Son's most holy name. Amen.